I scream, you scream. I, okay, I'm going to stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn-of-the-century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old-fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we have the invention of Philadelphia-style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, 
a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker. And he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. We're proud to be here today. Bassett was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, it means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and, you know, can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is... Love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> <laughs> and see. up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How nice to you? meet you. you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. 
They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're going to give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in D.C. for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no. No, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. To the, nods the, to Harlem, nods to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African-American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem. We're channeling childhood memories. We're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes! Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's. Small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference, and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And you're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford's. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem, at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food and it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom or are talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? Like, like, like. It's time for Sunday school. Say amen. Say hallelujah. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> my Sunday school teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should learn to scoop with your own, oh, my own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow.
All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mix-ins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to use a small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like, for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or it'll jam something, you know, things like that. And now, back to Sunday school. So what's my flavor? So your flavor, so we've heard around the way uh-huh. that, you, uh, that you're, a fan, you're a fan of cookies and cream. I am. Also, you like sweet potato pie. So I do. Okay, so this is a combination. And pecans. Of, well, right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie. But, but yeah. yes. I can tell you guys are married. For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust or pecan, uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm-hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, but he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, and you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta-da. Yeah. So, the cup, got a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm-hmm. Almost, oh, that's a sad scoop. No, no, oh, look, now good. you're going to form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're... Mm-hmm. Now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually... Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, Your Neck of the Woods. Oh, I like it. <laughs> Wow. And this, this is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So, this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults funny they would share (laughs) in las vegas a few miles off the strip is the flashy fabulous and insta famous ice cream shop creamberry opened in 2016 by husband and wife team danny and rosalina c hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe we set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy innovative desserts into one place for danny it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top for the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, 
adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino hala halo. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it would just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not going to come back mm. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food. But the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh, yeah, maybe not too much. It's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come.
Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.